So we're here on a missing persons case, something totally different for us. Yeah, how about an extra complicated challenge? Yeah. We are in Fort Myers, Florida, to investigate the mysterious disappearance of 34-year-old Rupinder Garaya, who was last heard from on October the 2nd, 2007. Rupinder was born in India. She's Punjabi. Mm -hmm. Her husband, Kultar, was 33. They had a two-year-old son. And it's just sad. They came to America to live out a dream. Mm -hmm. And look what happened. Rupinder and Coltar came to America with high hopes that they could stay here and live here and raise their son. Instead, this boy is left without a mother, and we need to get him answers. We don't have a body. We don't have a crime scene. We don't have those things that typically will help us tell a story. Not having a body or a crime scene can make it more difficult to prove a murder, but not impossible. Our job is to re-examine all of the evidence leading up to Rupinder's disappearance and... This one right here, right? Mm. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi, I'm Kelly. Hi, Doug Baker. Pleasure nice to meet you. Hi, Emily. Really nice to meet you. I'm so glad that you're here. Are you the only girl? No. No. Oh, wait, Chief, way to wow. go. Wow. <laughs> way to go. Well, we're going to work our tails off this week and hopefully get to where he needs to be. I expect you will. You got no, somewhere for us to work? Absolutely. All right. All right. Hey, Tim. Uh, how's everything? Have you met Emily yet? No, I haven't. Nice to meet Hi, you. Tim Hardiman. This week, Yolanda and I have invited Tim Hardiman, who is retired from the NYPD. He has a world of experience in homicide. He has kind of a funny accent, Emily, but we'll get used to it. <laughs> the Rupert de Goroya case here in Fort Myers is my first experience with the Cold Justice team. I was excited to get the call asking me to be part of it. Around the country, a missing adult, most police departments will treat as a voluntary missing. Fort Myers recognized right away that there was something funny about this case. Why don't you start off by telling us about Rupinder and her family? Rupinder and her husband um, came to the United States because she was involved in almost like an exchange student type of program, but as a nurse. When they came here, she had a work visa through this program, which is what he's actually still here on to this day. She has one child, and he is a special needs child. And that was just the light of her life. Rapinder was so devoted to her child, and as a parent, I can completely relate to that. And I have not met one person that has a bad word to say about her. She and Coltar struggled with childcare, and there ultimately was some friction in their marriage. Why don't you tell us y'all's working theory on what happened? Well, she was scheduled for a surgical procedure in September. She had abdominal surgery to have, um, I believe, a cancerous mass removed. Approximately two weeks after her surgery um, was about the last contact that anybody had with Rupinder. When Rupinder was off of work with the surgery, at some point she quit checking in with her supervisor and she looked into whether Rupinder was going to her own doctor and she called the house and finally called the police and demanded to file a missing persons report, which the Fort Myers Police Department took and this investigation began. Before we put the suspects on the board, why don't we first put up here the basic question, is she just missing or is she dead? Mm -hmm. Now, what would be the biggest, she just ran away? She's unhappy in the marriage. Mm -hmm. I know finances were a concern. Didn't he also say that she went to Orlando and was going to go to New York? Yes, Orlando and New York to find another job. The best witness to what was going on in Rupinder's life is Kultar, her husband. And his explanation to many, many people back then was that she left. She left to go find a better job, and there is no one here who can directly dispute that because she didn't have that many friends yet. I think another theory is another man. I, mean, well, I think I mean, any woman at that love, age another... that runs away, you would have to... She also could have been running away from her husband. I mean, we did have the Probably. DV. A few months before Rapinder's disappearance, she filed a domestic violence report against Coltar. He was arrested and charged, but a few days later, Rapinder paid his bond and set him free. If he hurt her after that, she could have run away for her own safety. What if he threatened her again? which would actually account for her staying off the radar, too. Mm -hmm. Can you think of anything else under the she really just ran away argument? All right, now let's consider murder. Our first suspect is her husband. Coltar Araya. So let's talk about him. Well, he was very angry about being arrested. She is the one that called 911. And the origin of that fight was over car keys because he had too much to drink and she would not allow him to take the car. Ugly marriage. Ugly marriage. Yeah. Do y'all think that him giving up custody of his son is also part of all this? Mm-hmm. 
Shortly after Rupinder went missing, Coltar turned over their young son to Child Protective Services. Coltar's here with his child. Oh my God, what do I do? This is a stressful time. He's probably aware enough to know I need some help. Well, if he actually believed that she was coming back, he wouldn't be giving up custody. That's a good point. It's also strange that Coltar asked his friend Saroop, who lives in California, to fly all the way to Florida right around the same time Rupinder went missing. Okay, so let's put up Mr. Saroop Singh. Coltar grew up with Saroop's son, and Saroop cares for Coltar. His allegiance is to Coltar. He doesn't have a personal relationship with Rupinder. Coltar and Saroop both claim that the reason for that trip is that they were looking for possible locations to open a restaurant at that time. Saroop could not verify the names or locations of the restaurant they went to go look at. If Coltar did kill Rupinder, we have to consider that he may have called Saroop to help him either conceal or commit the murder. That's your big question with Saroop. The biggest complication we have here is that a lot of the evidence that could point to Coltar as being the killer also could support the theory that Rupinder just ran away. Today we're meeting Rapinder's cousin, Ravneet, who flew all the way here from Australia. Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm Yolanda. It's nice, nice to nice meet you. you. Ravneet lived with Rapinder for five years in India, so she's very close with Rapinder's family. I'm her first cousin and like, like sisters. I think last time I talked to her, it was her birthday on 30th of September. So right before everything happened, yes, you're yes. talking to her on the computer. Yeah, she said, I'm like, I'm all right now. I'm going to my work. And she was very happy there that day. That's the last time I talked to her. And then she didn't call uh, after that. And uh, her family was worried. And we tried to call her many times. But her phone was on voicemail always. And uh, Kultar's phone was on voicemail as well. How do her parents feel about the possibility of this case finally being solved? They, they really want to know what happened to their uh, daughter. And Rupinder's father has been expired a few months ago. Oh, he did? Yeah, because oh, of wow. all, you know, it's a big loss for a father that, like, his daughter has been... It, was, it is really bad. Her mom... Whenever she talks about Rupinder, she always cries. It is really hard for her. Rupinder was like, she was very caring about everyone, each and uh, every person. You're doing great, okay? You're doing great. I would like to hear about Rupinder and Koltar's relationship, where it started when they were in India. It was an arranged marriage? Yeah, it was arranged marriage. In our culture, uh, like parents choose the guy for their daughters. Of course, they thought they were picking a very good man for their daughter. Yeah. So they get married. Like for, I think, few months, it was good. But after a few months, he started, you know, uh, dominating Rupinder and domestic violence. He okay. used to hit her as well. And then after that, we came to know that he was married uh, already. And we don't know what happened, why they get divorced. Is that very unusual for a divorce in India? Very unusual. Like in our culture, it's not a good thing for a girl to leave her husband. I think that all of us were familiar with domestic violence situations. And when you see the woman take the man back again, it's easy for us to sit and say, well, I would never do that. But Rupinder's situation was what we hear about all the time, but even more so. She was in a foreign country learning a new language at a brand new job with a two-year-old son married to a man who was abusive and also being told by her culture and her old world, you don't get divorced. And she had all those things weighing down on her. Regardless of what happens, it's not something that we ever stop working on. No matter what, we don't stop looking. You're wonderfully strong to come visit. When you hear the story of Rupinder, it breaks your heart. She came here to live the American dream. And to give up on this case is like saying, well, she's just from India. You know, what are we going to do? Thank you. Thank you Thank very, you. very much. And you, you realize that the Fort Myers Police Department never did give up, and you want to do something about it. We are in Fort Myers, Florida, where in 2007, Rupinder Garaya mysteriously disappeared. We know that Rupinder was in a strained marriage with her husband, Coltar Garaya. So while the police suspect foul play, we're still going to have to consider the possibility that she did just run away. 
So this is my sergeant. This is Sergeant Brian O'Reilly. Hi. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm Kelly. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, Kelly. You got an interesting bit of information. Yes, yeah, so out of the blue, I received a phone call from a gentleman, uh, and he said he had information about a missing person from 2007, and he said that he actually has had contact with Coltar. Wow. Out of the blue, he called and said that he works with them, so we're trying to get a statement from him on Saturday. This is a brand new name, not one of the ones you brand called Brand new us. name. Awesome. Sergeant O'Reilly says that a brand new witness has come forward with brand new evidence about the case. <laughs> Truly, as we're just sitting here, and then he says this witness's name is Chris Justice. Seriously. I want to see his driver's license. Why are you looking at the phone going, is yeah, this we, real? We, we, we all were just kind of like, what? Yeah. <laughs> the hopeful part of me is like, oh my God, please let it be true. It's really important that we talk to all of Rupinder's co-workers who reported her missing to see what insight they might have to what was going on in her life at that time. Could you please describe your initial relationship with Rapinda? Sure. There was a group of Indian nurses that were um, deployed to Southwest Regional. Mm -hmm. And so um, she was one of our, our employees. If you're a girl from India, like Rupinda, mm -hmm. why do you come to America to do this? For, for the American dream. Okay. Some of the things that were said were her husband was very upset because he wasn't living that dream. Yeah, we know that he was working at 7-Eleven and she had a higher paying job than him mm -hmm. as a registered nurse. Mm -hmm. Did she ever talk about seeking employment elsewhere? Never. She loved our hospital. She was very sweet, uh, kind of meek and timid, real shy. She started to come out of her shell, and it was just she liked it. She just started to giggle and have fun, and I just don't think she wanted to go. Now, were you familiar with um, the ovarian cancer that she had? Uh -huh. She was on leave due to the surgery. Mm -hmm. She was due to come back to work, and we really hadn't talked to her, so I thought, hmm, something's not right, so let's call. We couldn't get a hold of her. So you called the police to, yes. to find her, and yes. you were worried for her? Yes. The fact that she missed a follow-up appointment with her serious procedure, what does that say to you? To me, it was a red flag. Something happened. Coming off that major surgery, was she physically able to travel? It's possible that she was recovering from a surgery, so she's not gonna have the strength. So she was and, feeble then, yes, and we get that particular yes. time. Was there any indication uh, that Repinder had any mystery men in her life or a, no a work romance or anything? No, there is no way. Do you think she would ever leave her son? Absolutely not. She was very soft-spoken, really you know, quiet and to herself. But when she did talk, it was always about her son, always. So she loved her son? Absolutely. All she talked about was her son. That's all she cared about. She never would have went anywhere, New York, India, anywhere without that boy. She didn't go anywhere without him. Do you recall how she said her husband hurt her? He had choked her and she had come to the point of almost passing out and that she had gotten away. She said many times that she was afraid of him and that, you know, when when she didn't, if she wouldn't have gotten away, that he would have killed her. She said that to you? Yes. It's really doubtful that Rapinder would have ever abandoned her son, but people in desperate situations do desperate things. So until we find more evidence to the contrary, we need to consider that she possibly ran away. Hello, is this Sahib? In order to understand Rapinder's mindset on the day she went missing, it's very important that we talk to the last person we know she spoke with. We, we know that Rapinder Garaya uh, called you on October 2nd, 2007, that you guys had a 26 minute conversation, and you were the last person that she talked to. She called me, yes, one time I told her that uh, she was trying to uh, help uh, her parents to uh, somehow bring them over to Europe. So she was working to save money to bring her family from India to the United States? Yeah, because she had a good job, and uh, actually she wanted to help her, her parents, sister, brothers. Rapinder's family hoped that she would come to America and find a better life. And she was taking financial steps to help them do the same thing. So why would she just run away from her career? Did she ever talk about quitting her job and leaving it? Never. Did she tell you that she wanted to move away and find another job? I know. That's good. She was happy with her job. She was happy with her job? Yeah. Do you remember how the conversation ended? When, uh... She's talking and all of a sudden the phone uh, disconnected. The phone disconnected. Do you know if her husband was home? Did you hear his voice in the background at all? I can't say exactly what happened. That is a big 
eight bucks. Yeah. People often think about fingerprints and DNA as evidence, but all sorts of things can help us find clues about a crime. So Emily's retrieved boxes of her pinder's belongings out of evidence that were recovered from her and Coltar's apartment by police back in 2007. This looks like baby clothes. Baby clothes. The little boy's clothes. And then some of some diapers. I believe this was her purse and wallet with her, her everyday ID she leaves behind. Yep, and then a picture of her son. That was her life. That was her Florida ID card. And here is her social security card. Driver's license, passport, licenses. Mm -hmm. She had not one piece of identification with her. Even her copies are here. Yeah. If you're a woman who went away to find a new job or even ran off with a man, you would take your purse with you. You would take your driver's license and your passport because otherwise, how are you going to survive? Her certifications from India. Did you put it all in the cellophane like that? Did no, do this that? is everything it as for is. her. Yep. So she had it preserved that perfectly in her house. Right. There's no way she's looking for another job and leaving that behind. Uh, no, no, you have to have this. Photographs. Mm -hmm. Wow. She's with him all the time. I mean, you can see it in all the pictures. These documents and photos show us a woman who was very oh. proud of her career and totally devoted to wow. her son. This is why people come to America, the dream of building a better life for themselves and for their babies. But while Rupinder was doing that, Kultar was sinking into his own state of jealousy and rage. Papa. Papa. No mother who loved her baby the way Rupinder loved Devin would ever leave him, especially with an abusive father. And she would not desert the career she was so proud of or the life that she had just created for her and her child. It is clearer than ever that there's no way this woman ran away. She was murdered. And we just have to prove it. Hey, Chris. Hey, this is Sergeant Riley, Fort Myers Police. We're going to talk to Chris Church. He was a neighbor of Ruth Pinder and Pultars right around the time of the murder to see what he could have heard. What did you observe of the relationship between Ruth Pinder and her husband? They didn't seem to have a uh, connection between each other. I've been off to be we lived together, but that was it. After she disappeared, he began throwing out all the furniture, the kids' toys, everything. Just uh, put it at the dumpster area there. And I, I thought, well, if she comes back, why is he throwing out all the stuff? During the time she went missing, I do remember having a smell in the, in the dumpster, but I, you know, I, uh, of a dead animal. Is there any way you can say when the smell was? I would say it was uh, probably during that week she went missing. We all want to go to the apartment complex to get a better appreciation of the layout of the complex and also how this dumpster plays in. This is their building? This is their building. We can't ever say for sure where he killed her, but the big question always is, what happened to her body? The proximity to the dumpster that's from the that's apartment. behind that, that concrete wall? Yeah. yeah. Have you ever been here at night? Is it fairly dark in this parking lot? Would you it not is. be able to see? And once you get there, by design, you're covered from view. In a case with very little physical evidence, you have to try to get inside a suspect's head and use common sense to try to figure out how a crime could have occurred. So this is how the compactor works? Yes. So you throw your stuff in there, it makes it even smaller and smashes it so you can put more in. Right. This is quite a bit of a different dumpster than I was I was. Now look, it more, says, the open it one. says it starts automatically, so that means you don't control it. When it gets full, it kicks in, so he didn't put her here. Because she could be sitting here until God knows who comes next to dump unless, their trash. Unless he waited, because this is a big facility. These are usually always pretty full. And Chris Church observes Coltar throwing a lot of household items away, small furniture. Maybe he was trying to stack that dumpster and make it sure that it, the compactor ran and concealed her from the switch on that. Right. If he puts her in and then keeps dumping stuff on top of it to make that compactor work, and he knows trash is within a day, He's probably figuring eh, if anybody does smell her, it won't be for long and it'll be emptied and gone. And it goes straight to the incinerator. Yeah. It is completely, completely that, that would be some feeling for him sitting right there watching, watching that thing it go away. pull up. He'd want to pop a champagne cork. I don't think anybody can rationally say, I know exactly what he did with it because we don't. Right. But this is a possibility. It would be a big risk for Coltar to dispose of Rapinder's body at the apartment complex with all the neighbors so close by. Perhaps he would have driven her body to dispose of in a more remote area. 
Emily, this is Murray. Hello. He's a super geek. <laughs> it's wonderful to meet you. We're hoping that a computer that was seized from Pultar's apartment shortly after Rupendra went missing can give us some clues. What I'd like to go over with you right now are some images that were on the computer. There's a lot of pictures of maps. It's like the end of Florida there. Charlotte Harbor. Who has maps like that on their computer randomly? That's weird. It's kind of interesting, though, because all the snippets of maps seem to be areas where there's swampy land and wooded, wooded areas. Area. Buried among Coltar's files are a series of maps of remote areas in Florida. Perfect places to hide a body. They're all isolated areas, yes. whether it's water or country, it's all mm -hmm. isolated. If Coltar did dump her body in the middle of nowhere, he might have needed help doing that. We believe that Rupinder Garaya was murdered back in 2007. Another tragic victim of this case was her young son, Devin, who not only lost his mother, but his father gave him up to Child Protective Services due to special needs. You ready? Devin was adopted by a wonderful family, and today, for the very first time, he's going to meet Rupinder's cousin, Robin Eat, and her family. Come on. I love you so much. Hey, buddy. Your uncle. My name is Nick. How are you? Good. Good? He's your brother. Can you guys hug? My name is Devin, and I am nine years old while I'm turning ten. She's crying, eh? This is the first time I'm meeting my aunt and uncle, and I'm very happy that my whole family is together now. What do you like, buddy? Video games. Video games. And cars. <laughs> I'm feeling very relaxed after meeting him that he is in good hands. He's very happy and I'm really thankful to them. He's handsome. Damien is awesome. Like his mom. Devin is now at the age of where he's asking questions about his mom. All of that makes us more determined to find out exactly what happened. Tomorrow we can focus on that good witness from Sarasota. Golly, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of scared because luck doesn't usually happen like that. Right when we got into town, a brand new witness said he had information about this case. His name is Chris Justice, so you can't help but think, uh, I don't know what to think about that. That really is his name? He really exists? It's, it's Christopher Justice. Oh, we got his whole driver's license, birthday, right, address, he's but no, he's a legit person. Wow. It seems like he's checking out and we have a meeting set up to actually talk to him in the next few days. But right now, we need to determine if Coltar's friend, Saroop Singh, might have played a role in Rupinder's murder. In Saroop's initial statement, he claimed that he arrived in Florida shortly after Rupinder's murder to try and look at potential restaurant properties. But Saroop was unable to recall any detail about these properties. Saroop and his wife now live in Oregon, so we're headed all the way across the country to try and talk to him. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. My name's Rupinder P. There's an interpreter who's going to work with us since he does not speak English well. I would like to know what he did, where they went while he was in Florida visiting with Coltar. California, Murke, New Mexico, drug stop, the tape, and I'll be at the restaurant. Let me do it like this. We want to talk about the trip he took to Florida right after Rupinder got missing. It was 2007, and it was right after Singh got his security guard license. This is the security guard, Williams. He is in the yard then. I'm not getting simple answers to simple questions. As an investigator, you like to communicate with someone. You like to read not only what they're saying, but how they're saying it. When you're dealing not only with a different language, but with a different culture, that's a challenge. Who made your airplane reservations for you to come to Florida? Did he ever show you the one restaurant that he spoke to you about on the phone? No. Okay. 
ਜਾਣ ਬੁੱਝ ਕੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਸ਼ੱਕ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਾਉਣ ਨੂੰ ਜੋ ਕੁਝ ਕੀਤਾ ਹੈ ਨਾ ਕੀਤਾ ਹੋਊਗਾ ਸਭ ਕੁਝ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਤੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਇਹਨੇ ਨਾਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਰ ਦੇ ਟੈਂਗਲ ਕਰਨ ਨੂੰ ਸੱਤਿਆ ਉੱਤੇ ਮੇਰੇ ਇਹ ਕੋਈ ਸੋਚ ਹੈ and all i want to know is where her body is main me gal so mujhe mainu pata hoye main jis pe nahi kitna ne mainu pehle se puchhe maula dag na i was hoping that sarup would implicate or exonerate himself and in involvement or tell us what coltar confided in him during his trip to florida in october of 07 at this point it's not a whole lot of help to tell us the truth so oh, man the cell oh hoy mainu pata ye ram ka mainu koi nahi pata We didn't get much from Sarub last night, but we're not done. We're going to try to talk to Sarub's wife, Paranjit. She is really critical to this case because she had a lot of contact with Koltar over the years. Did Koltar make any comments about harming his wife or what may have happened to his wife? Ki kurta ne tade tade naal kade koi gall baat kiti ki asi ta je vekhi vi nahi. Haan ji. ਆਂਦਾ ਵੀ ਉਹ ਪਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿਹੜੀ ਸਟੇਟ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੈ ਉੱਥੇ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਉਹਨੇ ਵਿਆਹ ਕਰਾ ਲਿਆ ਉਹ ਪਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਕੀ ਕੁਝ ਬੋਲੇ ਤੇ ਫੇਰ ਆਂਦਾ ਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਸੱਚੀ ਗੱਲ ਦੱਸਾਂ ਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਮਾਰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਹੈ ਪਤਾ ਕੀ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਤਾਂ ਚੰਗਾ ਕੰਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਮਾੜਾ ਮੈਂ ਰੋਣ ਲੱਗ ਪਈ ਤੇ ਮੁੜ ਕੇ ਆਂਦਾ ਮੰਮੀ ਰੋਵਾਂ ਨਾ ਕੁਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੇ ਬੱਚੇ ਵਰਗਾ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਸੀ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਪਿਆਰ ਕਰਦੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਭ ਤੋਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਮੈਂ ਇਹਨੂੰ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੀ ਸਾਂ ਔਰ ਜਦੋਂ ਇਹਨੇ ਆ ਗੱਲ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਦੱਸੀ ਨਾ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਇੰਨੀ ਨਫ਼ਰਤ ਹੋ ਗਈ ਨਾ ਇਹਦੇ ਤੋਂ ਇੰਨੀ ਨਫ਼ਰਤ ਹੋ ਗਈ ਜੀ ਕੋਈ ਹੱਦ ਸੋ ਸਾਈ ਟੂ ਸਾਈ ਹਰ ਕਿੰਦੇ ਮਾਫ ਕਰੋ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਗੱਲ ਯਾਦ ਕਰਾਈ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਵੀ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਲੱਗੇ ਕਿ ਇਹਨੇ ਹਰਾਮ ਜਾਦੇ ਨੇ ਮਾਰ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਮੈਂ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਸ਼ੀ ਵਾਂਟਸ ਟੂ ਫਾਈਂਡ ਆਊਟ ਵਾਟ ਹੈਪਨਡ ਟੂ ਹਰ ਵਾਟ ਸ਼ੀ ਮੇਡ ਇਟ ਟੂ she feels very hurt by what has happened it's been sitting very heavily on her heart so i'm so sorry to to cause her pain i i know this is difficult but we are we are trying to help we are trying to help thank you we all got to meet Saroop face to face um based on your interview and all you saw what are your thoughts about whether or not he should still be on our suspect board my thoughts are that Saroop has no involvement with this disappearance i'm not convinced that coltar didn't make a statement to him but the man i met i don't see him getting rid of a body okay so we're all agreeing that he's a witness with knowledge but no involvement whatsoever correct i think he is at this point just a helpful witness to that time frame yo and tim you agree yeah after hearing the things that he said i think that he was just another pawn in all of this manipulated with, mm-hmm. without a doubt okay so then emily that takes care of sort saying once and for all with all of your questions and concerns and now we can focus on coltar and look at that board up there and see if we can make it even better With all of our focus now on Coltar Garaya for Rupender's murder, we need to try and find out what else he did or said in all the years that followed. So we're going to go talk to some of his old housemates he lived with soon after Rupender went missing to see if he ever said anything to them about his wife's murder. Hi. This is Emily and I'm Kelly and this is Muhammad. Do you know Coltar? Coltar, yeah. Yeah, the you- wife killer. What's your name? <laughs> Janelle. Janelle Strauss lived in this house with Coltar for a while and she seems very willing to help. How long ago did Coltar live here? He just moved out not too long ago um because I was calling the police on him because he was bringing hookers to the house. I'd hear it all night long. My oh. son would hear it and I was tired of it. He's a repulsive individual. Did so he I have much of a temper when he drank? Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the comments he's made about his wife. He said, "Google my name, you'll see what I'm about." And he was talking about his wife. So, we googled his name and they never found a body or anything. Oh, he told me that he knows where his wife is that she lives in Ireland. The part about Ireland was straight out of his mouth mm-hmm. to you. So what other people are you aware of that he's made comments about? Kelsey was not. Wife? Kelsey was a girl that was staying here. You would have to ask her. I have her phone number. You too. Mm-hmm. She lives about 15 minutes away. When he drinks, he gets violent. He hasn't like been violent towards me or Nelly, but he's like threatened us and threatened her son and he was just like, "Oh, Google my name, see what I'm about." I can make you disappear like my wife. He said I can make you disappear like yeah. my wife. 
After that happened, I just kept my distance from him. I didn't want to be around him. I didn't want to be alone with him. Coltar not only has confessed committing this murder, but he's bragged about it. He's almost proud of it. He even used it as intimidation. The more people he talks to, the better this case gets. That's going to be him right there. Standing outside waiting for you. It's finally time to meet Chris Justice. He's the brand new witness that called with information right around the time we got into town. I cannot wait to hear what he has to say. We reached out to the Fort Myers Police Department in reference to some information that you received uh, from a Coltar Garaya about his ex-wife and some admissions that he made. Is this the individual that you know as Coltar Garaya? Yes, it is. And how long ago did you meet him? Maybe six months ago. You said he said something to you uh, in reference to his wife's disappearance. About two weeks ago, we worked out together at the auction. Right before we started driving, he had a water bottle and poured his water out and put the run in there in the parking lot at okay. 7 30. 7 30 in the morning, yes. So we we're actually sitting there talking. Um, it was just different stuff. And then I asked him about um, his kids, how many kids he had. And but he was telling me he didn't want to talk about his wife. I said, man, it's cool, man. It was just me and you talking, you know. And he actually opened his mouth and said, she talked too much and she lied to him and he, he had a joker i'm like you had to kill her and he said yes he killed her and um you know i, I don't know what to say then now when he told you that he choked his wife did he do anything with his hands did he demonstrate anything or he just say i choked her no he just did this he, he, he had to choke her. he had to kill her and you know he just she talked too much and she lied to him it's, it's exactly what and he said he had to kill her this is a picture of her Pinagaraya and her son, her beautiful son. Yeah, go ahead. You know, we appreciate you being a good Samaritan and doing the right thing. You just wanted to get this off your chest and tell us what happened. Is there anything else you know about Coltar as a person or, or what happened that you think would help us? Not only do we have a lot of people from Coltar's past, now we have a man from today who says that he also heard the same story that he killed his wife. Wow, there's no way he's any kind of ulterior motive. No. He's freaking fantastic. After seven years, we have a witness that remembers when Coltar's describing what happened to Repenter that he choked her, just like this. That's admissible evidence going to show cause of death. He choked her. He's not making it up. He doesn't know him well enough to be mad at him. He's got no reason to hate him. And that was your witness. How would you feel? Uh, oh. He's wonderful. on Coltar honestly couldn't get a whole lot better. It's pretty darn good. It is. And the only person left to talk to in the whole wide world is him. He has no ties that he has to stay in America. He can flee. Once he does that, we're never going to find him. Also, I really think that if he feels that we're going to get him, he's going to be unable to control himself. He could ascertain who the likely witnesses are against him, and we're putting them all in danger. Then we can't go to Coltar until she has her warrant. To get the warrant, you got to go to your state's attorney. Right. We build a great circumstantial case that tells the tragedy of what happened to Rupinder Garaya. There's no way she's looking for another job and leaving that behind. Rupinder would have never left her career, and even more important than that, she would have never left the love of her life, her baby son. It was always about her son. Always. We're certain she did not run away. She was murdered. While Rupinder was thriving in America, Coltar was not, which led to drinking, jealousy, and rage that ultimately drove him to murder. She said many times that she was afraid of him. Coltar could not keep his story straight about her whereabouts. He did say she went to New York to go to another hospital. Oh, he told me that she lives in Ireland. And most damning of all, Coltar's violent nature caused him to brag and even use Rupinder's death as a threat to other people. He's confessed many times in detail that he killed Rupinder. Google my name, see what I'm about. If I can make you disappear like my wife. I'm like, you had to kill her? And he said yes. This is the kind of case where you're ready to talk to probable cause. Bring him on. Let's go. They don't get any better than this. Wow, what a case. You ready to go talk to the state's attorney about all that? Yes, I am. I'm more than ready. <laughs> Thinking you're going to have some good luck because it's a great case. Thank good luck, you. girl. All righty. What That's happened, cool. girl? Hey. Emily's back. I am. And I uh, brought these with me because we are going to need to use them right away. Are you serious? Yes. Oh my God! All right. 
This is a long time coming. So I'm excited to show the family that the person's going to be held responsible and made accountable for their actions. Papa. Papa. And I really look forward to the expression on Coltar's face. Papa. When he knows it's time. Papa. This is Detective Destefanich from the Fort Myers Police Department. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you want to go. You just want to talk to you? No, I, I don't want to go. I understand. You know, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Okay. She's explaining your, your rights no, what's no. happening to you. Okay. That's all. So you are under arrest for the murder of Rick Pender in 2007. You will be extradited at some point to Lee County to face prosecution for this. Coltar has been arrested for the murder of Rupinder. Now we're going to meet with Rupinder's cousin Ravneet to tell her the great news. She has waited a very long time and come a long way to try and get some answers and to be able to give her those answers is a wonderful feeling. Hi, Hi. Ravneet. Hi. How are you? Are you doing okay? Oh, it's good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> You've been waiting to hear what we have to tell you, right? Yeah. So the meeting uh, was today with the state attorney's office, the prosecutors, and you will be happy to hear that Emily has just arrested Coltar for murdering Rupinder. So you can tell your family back home it could not have gone any better, okay? I'm really thankful to you guys. You have given us the hope. Like, first we are, we was hopeless. We, we didn't know anything what happened. What's like, but now you guys have done a very great thing for us. We can't bring her back. But knowing this, that who did it is getting the punishment. What he did, her family, they will be happy. I want you guys to meet with the Damien and family. Was he here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. great. Hi, Damien. Are you must be Trish. Yes, I am. Nice Trish. to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you too. This week, Devin got to meet Rob Neat, who brought all kinds of pictures to tell him everything they can possibly tell him about his mother. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Miraculously, his story has a happy ending, and he's being raised by a fantastic woman named Trisha, and he couldn't be any happier. Even though Rupinder is no longer here, her case brought them all even closer as a family and they can all communicate with a sense of peace that the person who took Rupinder away is going to be held accountable. All new episodes of Cold Justice return April 10th at 8 on TNT.